Amen. Good to see you all this morning. You all well? Yeah, some of you. Okay, hallelujah. Cool. Okay, so I'm going to... Uh, my, my, my sermons today is titled Watch and Pray. And uh, so if you've got a Bible, if you'd like to open to Mark chapter 14, I'm going to look at verses 32 to 34. <coughs> now... Um, this, when I was meditating on the passage of Scripture this week, this did not go where I thought it was going to go. So that's what I love about meditating on Scripture. The Lord just leads you on his own little, little way, and it all links Scripture to Scripture to Scripture. It's fantastic. And uh, it says, um, so this is on the night that Jesus was betrayed. This is just before he was betrayed. And it says, and they, they came to a place called Gethsemane, and Jesus said to his disciples, sit here, <coughs> excuse me, sit here while I pray. But he took Peter, James, and John with him, And as he became deeply distressed and troubled, he said to them, My soul is full of sorrows, even unto death. Remain here and stay awake. Now, we have a a poignant moment here that's going on for Jesus. You see, Jesus' disciples had been told and had been warned that he would be handed over, that he would be betrayed, that he would be crucified, and that he would die. Um, uh, But his disciples are completely oblivious and completely unawares as to what is about to transpire and what is about to happen. You enjoying that cake there, Paul? Yeah? <laughs> Someone eating some cake while he's listening to me. This is a good sermon. Mm. <laughs> so, um, and we know that when Jesus came back, that he didn't, his disciples didn't pray for him and didn't stay watching and praying because they fell asleep. So if we look at verses 37 to 38, it says, He came back and found them asleep and said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not stay awake for even one hour? Keep watch and pray so that you will not fall into any temptation. And so here we have this tragic moment for Jesus. At the one time in Jesus' life, at the darkest moment in his life, he needed his guys, he needed his disciples, he needed his friends, his brothers to be there to help him, to support him, to just be by his side to help him come through this time. You know, remember the the story of Moses, he's on the mountain and Joshua is out with the armies of the Lord and they're fighting the Amalekites and when Moses had his arms up high, the the battle was going God's way. When his arms began to droop, it went the Amalekites' favour. And so he had to have his brothers, he had, uh, I think it was Aaron and Hur, that held his arms up. And at this moment, Jesus is in a time of great tumult. He needs his arms to be held up. He needs his friends to be there. It was Jesus' darkest hour. But the, uh, the disciples were completely oblivious as to what this, the time was about to, to come about. You see, it's all right for us. You know, we read these stories day in, day out. We know how it's going to go. Yeah, we know Judas is going to come in. We know it's going to be a big betrayal. We know Jesus is going to be crucified. But hey, everything's all right on Sunday again. These guys didn't know any of that. They knew nothing. They had no idea what was literally about to transpire. And I find this is exactly, ironically, where the church is today. That we're, that the body of Christ, which is the church, is coming into the darkest hour, one of the darkest hours in modern history that's going on in the world right now, and the church is completely oblivious. The church is completely asleep. When she should be watching and when she should be praying, she's doing no such thing, neither. It's like, well, you know, whatever. Um, and I think this is quite, dis- quite, I don't know about you, but I find it very disconcerting. I find it very worrying that uh, we're in the age that we're in with the things that are going on in the world that are and the church should be praying, watching, having an answer, providing a solution or, you know, or speaking out and she's doing absolutely nothing. She's just pretending that it will all just go away. But it's not. Now when Jesus uses the phrase watch and pray, nearly, apart from this time in John, nearly all times that he uses it, it's always referring to the end of days and the return of Christ. There's a classic example here in Luke 21, 36, where it says, uh, be always, not sometimes, not when the mood takes you, not when it looks, when it's in vogue and when it's in fashion, be always on the watch and pray. Why? That you may be able to escape all that is about to happen. And that you may be able to stand before the Son of Man. So it's important that you always, always watch and always pray so that you may escape what is coming and that you may be able to stand. Amen? And I fear, you know, we, our, I mean, our society, we, I've, I mean, just looking at Britain alone, let alone every other country, but our politics is in crisis. 
You know, everything in this nation is in crisis. Our economy is right on the skids. Uh, we have the potential, I'm not saying it is, but we have a potential of World War III just round the corner, the way things are going. And, but it seems to be this malaise and this lack of concern in the church, like, well, it will all just pass me by somehow and it's not really that important. Someone's given me a phone call. I wonder who it could be. Yeah. So, um, and we're just completely not aware, and we're just pl- completely not engaging. I meet often with Christians that, that are, because we're not a mainstream church, I don't know if you've noticed that. Um, but, uh, and so, you know, most people, I get people come to our conferences and stuff, and they come from mainstream churches, and they're like, you know, it's really chilling me that in our church, they just don't talk about anything that's going on out there in the world. It's as though we're all just living in some woolly, fluffy, utopian Christian bubble that is not interested in what's going out in the world. When actual fact, Jesus gave us a great commission to go into all the world and to preach the gospel and to baptize people in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But we're not doing it. It's now called the Great Omission now, as I, as I like to joke. And so the church at this, this hour should be watching and praying and it's just simply not doing it. Luke 8, sorry, Luke 18, verse 8 says, When the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Jesus is coming back. I don't know if you've noticed that. He will come back. And when he comes back, is he going to find faith on the earth? Well, that's a rather telling, poignant thing to ask. Well, you know, maybe 200 years ago, we'd have said, well, of course he will. But now look at us. You know, in, in the east of the world, Christianity is thriving. But here in the west, it's dying. Okay. And Jesus comes back. And if Jesus was to return to his church today, okay, especially here in the West, not so much in the East, but if Jesus was to come back to the church and he he looked at the church in the West, do you think he would be like really really happy with us? Um, I think if the Apostle Paul was alive today, we'd be getting a letter. Seriously, we'd be getting a letter, big time. All right? Yeah, step into my office. And and it frightens me that that we are, are, you know... I mean, even during the Second World War, even the Prime Minister had sense enough to call days of prayer, national days of prayer. But nobody wants to do that anymore. You can't even get Christians to go to a prayer meeting. And it's like, well, you know, and we're coming into these dark hours, and I just don't understand. It, uh, Jesus said in Luke 21, 36, as I said before, be always on the watch and pray that you may be able to escape what is about to happen and that you may be able to stand before the Son of Man. So watching and praying is essential for what is coming, and it helps us to escape what is coming. How does it help you escape? Because sometimes God gives his people wisdom to understand the signs of the times, like the sons of Issachar in the times of David. They understood the signs of the times, and therefore they could do things in accordance with that season and that time that helped them remain strong. You have people like Joseph that God raised up during a time of great famine. He didn't raise Joseph up to save Egypt. He rose Joseph up to save Israel so that the people of God would have someone at the helm that could physically help them. You know, sometimes super Christians get all a bit super spiritual about everything. It's like, well, you know, God will provide. Well, no, if he's told you something's coming and something's happening, then it's called common sense and wisdom to do something about it. You do everything you can and then God does the rest. The name Joseph means God will add that which is lacking. In other words, once you've done all you can do, God will do the rest. But if you're not going to do anything, well, why should God? And I don't know about in your book, but someone who knows something's coming and does nothing about it is what I call an idiot. Right? Now you say, Chris, you can't call someone a fool. That's what the Bible calls a fool. You know what's coming and you do nothing about it. You're an idiot. You're a fool. All right? So, <laughs> just, just speaking bluntly, and so there's this... A real kind of this malaise in this church, this, well, it doesn't really matter, who cares anyway? And of course, they would never say who cares anyway, but by, the, by our indifference and the fact that we're just not bothered. Um, you know, I speak to people, and it's like, can you not see what's going on? They're like, well, you know, it'll pass. They always pass. They come and go. People have been saying what you're saying for years and years and years, and nothing ever happens. It's like, that's not the point. The point is, is that we are to watch and pray. That means it doesn't matter if it's the very end of days or we're like halfway through or, or, or coming up to. The point is, is that as a church, or as the church corporate around the world, we have an obligation to pray for the nations, to pray for those in authority and pray that you know, God's blessing and God's word will come about on our land, praying for righteousness in the government and things like that. Because you see, when we don't pray, it creates a vacuum and something else will fill it. You know, It's like in this nation... 
where atheism came in and, uh, and various other issues like liberalism came into our nation, I'm not talking about liberalism of liberal politics from like maybe the 1900s, I'm talking about hyper-left liberal politics. And now what they've done is like, we don't want religion in our schools, we don't want Christianity in this nation, we want to get rid of it all. But you see, if you Google this, 50% of the world's population is religious. 50%. That's not all Christian. That's like Islam, uh, Christianity, and various other faiths and stuff. So 50% of the whole of this earth, people on it, are religious. Okay? So now secularists seem to be in this, live in this deluded bubble that no one possibly believes in God anymore. And so what they've done is they've kicked God out of this country. But you see, you, you can't kick God out if maybe there's a large proportion of your society that does believe in God. So what you do is you just replace it with something else. Nature abhors a vacuum. You get Christianity, something else will come to take over instead. And now we have another big religion that's coming into our nation. Now, I'm not, you know, people might go, oh no, is he racist? I'm not racist. I'm just saying spiritually what's going on in our nation that again, even the church is just completely oblivious to. We have a real problem uh, on our streets right now. There's uh, many years ago, because God speaks to me in dreams sometimes, and, and one of the dreams I had it was called, Woe to those that are at ease in Zion. I didn't actually realize there was a scripture for it at the time. And the scripture comes from Amos chapter 6, verses 1 and then 3 to 5. And I'll just read it to you. It's a very poignant scripture considering where we're at now. And uh, it says, Woe well unto those at ease in Zion, and to those who feel secure on Mount Samaria, you notable men of the foremost nation to whom the people of Israel come. You push away every thought of coming disaster, but your actions only bring the day of judgment closer. How terrible for you who sprawl on ivory beds and lounge on your couches, eating the meat of tender lambs from the flock and of choice calves fattened in the stall. You sing trivial songs to the sound of the harp and fancy yourselves to be the great musicians like David. You drink wine by the bowlful and perfume yourselves with fragrant lotions and you care nothing for the ruin of your nation. And I had this dream years ago. And in this dream, I walked around this big city. This city was all of Christendom. And uh, as I was walking around it, it looked very, very pretty and very glorious and old type buildings and stuff. And I could hear the voice of God saying, woe unto those at ease in Zion, woe unto those at ease in Zion. And then I went in to this into Christendom, and I went into one of these like big citadels, and there was all these Christians, and they'd interlocked all these tables together. It was like a big banqueting table, and all this food was there, and having a great time, and it was all very fun. But there in the corner was the TV. I see the TV a lot in my dreams, and the TV was just showing the news of the, of the terrible things that were going on in the world. But the church wasn't interested in that. They just wanted to have a party, and have some fun, and eat lots of food. And all the while I was watching this, I heard the voice of God saying, Woe unto those at ease in Zion. I had another dream once, <coughs> where in this dream, I, I was, it was a bit weird, but I was, the, I was like the church. And in this dream, I was this kind of happy-go-lucky guy. And it was Friday night, and I was like, yeah, I was dressing up. We're going to go out with my Christian friends. We're going to go down wherever, and we're just going to have a good time and stuff. And again, the news was on. And terrible things were going on in the world, and I was just completely ignoring it. There was lots of weird stuff going on in this dream as well, like there was this big farm, and on this farm was a big farmer, and he had all these kind of weirdos that were saying, the end is nigh, the end is nigh, and no one was listening to them because they're the crazy guys, right, the fringe guys, so they were out there on the fringe, I wasn't listening to them, uh, and then there were some other people, and I wasn't listening to them, and then suddenly I heard this scream of all these people, and I looked up, and there was this tidal wave about 100 foot high, and then it just stopped and paused, and I looked around, as the church, and I, I saw an angel just over the street, and I shouted to the angel, why didn't you tell me? Why didn't you warn me that these things were about to happen? And the angel said, I sent you my prophets, but you ignored them. And he said, I sent these other people, I can't remember who they were, and you ignored them. And even if you ignored them, it was on the evening news. You should have seen that this was coming, but you chose to do nothing about it. And with that, the tidal wave started moving again, and it collapsed over this nation and caused all kinds of devastation. And the church had to get up to high ground if she was to survive. There was another dream I had, it was like one of the first series of dreams I had about 25 years ago, and I was, it was down, down at the beach on the south coast, and all these Christians were having a barbecue, and they were all having fun, and there, coming over the horizon was this dark storm cloud, the likes that I'd never seen before, and I knew this thing was dangerous, really dangerous, and I was shouting to the Christians, you need to get out, come on, it's danger is coming, you need to do something, clear this area, get out, and they looked at me as, as though I were mad. They couldn't see what was coming. 
I could see it clearly, but nobody cared. They just wanted to play their games and just wanted to picnic and do business as usual. And that's the state of the church today. It's on the horizon, it's coming to us, and the church is doing nothing about it and cares nothing for it. And we come to that famous parable in Matthew 25, verses 1 to 13, about the wise and the foolish bridesmaids. Okay, listen to this. This is quite an interesting passage of scripture when you put it in context for today. Obviously, it has its own context for the end of days. It says, At that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish, and five were wise. Foolish is a kind word for stupid. Okay, so five of them were stupid, and five of them were wise. The foolish ones took their lamps, but did not take any oil with them. The wise ones, however, took oil in jars along with their lamps, and the bridegroom was a long time in coming, and they all became drowsy and fell asleep. And at midnight, the cry rang out, Here's the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all the virgins woke up, trimmed their lamps, and the foolish ones said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, our lamps are going out. No, they replied, there may not be enough for us both. Instead, go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourself. But while they were on their way to buy oil, the bridegroom arrived. The virgins who were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. And later the others came. Lord, Lord, they said, open the door for us. But he replied, truly, I tell you, I don't know you. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know the day or the hour. Now, what's interesting about this passage is that everybody fell asleep. Okay, The stupid ones and the wise ones, they both fell asleep. But so was the rest of the village. Everybody was asleep. And if we're ever living in a world that is completely <laughs> asleep, it is now. The church is asleep. Even those that claim they're awake, they're asleep. And even the world is completely asleep. And then come something cataclysmic happens. There's this almighty shout. A cry rings out in midnight. In like the, you know, part, it's not the darkest hour, but certainly one of the darkest hours of the night. Midnight and three o'clock are the two darkest points. And a, a cry came out. Everybody would have heard this cry. Not, not just the bridesmaids. The whole village would have heard it. Okay? So something is coming. Something will come in history, future history that will wake everybody up. What is that? What is going on? And then suddenly the church will finally begin to wake up. But of course, there are two types of uh, people here. Those that have got a lamp with oil in it, and they've both got lamps with oil, but one's not got very much oil, and one's got, you know, lots of oil. Psalm 119, 105 says, Your word is a lamp for my feet, a light on my path. And so what is this about? I mean, there's lots of interpretations to this, but just for the sake of today, it's about the illumination of the Spirit and his word in the lamp, because the oil represents the Spirit, the lamp represents the word. Okay, that's what scripture teaches. So at the end of days, both the apostate church, which is the Laodicean church, and the so-called awake church or prepared church will, ha will both fall asleep and they'll both wake up when God calls some, in some way that the church will wake up from a call from heaven. But of course, it's down to the oil in our lamps that, is, that determines whether we're going to make it or not into that, into that end, end of days. So it's not enough to be awake as a Christian. I know loads of Christians are like, I'm awake, I'm well informed about what's going on in the world. Good, you're well informed, what are you doing about it? Nothing. Do you pray any more than you used to? Nope. So how are you awake? Well, because I watch lots of YouTube doom porn and I, I'm completely informed on what's going on in the world. No, you're, you're an idiot. You're more of an idiot than those that don't know anything because you claim to know something and are doing nothing about it. That makes you a foolish virgin. Or bridesmaid, don't know about your virginity, but anyway, we'll go. that's not a story we're going to. And so if you're building your life on incorrect foundations, then trouble is brewing for you. For you. If you know stuff and you're not preparing for it, you can be put in the idiot camp. You know? And there are people that, because of bad theology, um, are just not awake to what's going on right now. 70% of churches in Great Britain are, for those that understand what I'm talking about, are amillennial in their theology. In other words, they don't believe that there will be an end of days. They don't believe in an antichrist. They don't believe there will be great wars and tribulation at the end. They don't believe in any of that because they believe all that was fulfilled in like AD 70 in the book of Revelation. Who can understand it anyway? So we're never going to talk about it. We never preach on it and we just don't go there. Okay, that is 70% of your average evangelical church, whether it's Catholic, whether it's Protestant, whether it's Orthodox. Actually, it's actually fair that Greek Orthodox are a little bit more switched on to this than, than most. And, and that's a shame, right? 
And so you've got all of these churches, and they're not even awake. And they don't even have the right oil in their lamps. Because, because they don't see what's going on, they might just think, well, what's going on in the world? I'm going to show you a little video to end today of some of the things that are going on around the world that are biblical signs. Okay? Now, even the heathen know that these are biblical signs. And do you know who doesn't want to know that it's biblical signs? you want to know who's downplaying that these are biblical signs? The Christians! Because they're asleep! Because they're in the dull idiot camp. I don't mean to be rude, but the Bible says, don't be a fool, don't be an idiot, be wise and have understanding and seek the Lord and seek his way and seek wisdom and all you're getting, get knowledge. In other words, it's down to you and me to not be stupid and to be wise in the things of God. Okay? And that's the condition of the oil that we're putting in our lamps. You know, and uh, just to touch on another button while I'm here, I'm really... I was, I was really aggrieved the other day um, that somebody said, you know, I, I, can't, I said something about, you know, we're building our, our monastery and stuff and all that kind of thing up the road. And they were like, um, well, as if Jesus doesn't rapture us next year. I was like, why, why would you even say that? And it's like, so that those that sit in the, in the uh, pre-trip rapture camp, and I don't care who, who is and who isn't, but it's like some of them are really kind of like, well, it doesn't really matter what's going on in the world because I'm going to be taken out of here anyway. It's not my problem. That's awful. It's an awful thing to think. You should be on your knees. You should be praying. We should be out there preaching the gospel and seeing people set free and seeing people saved. If you knew Jesus was coming tomorrow, you wouldn't just like, well, let's put on, a, let's put on the Jesus movie tonight and we'll just sit back, chill out, and just wait till he comes in the morning. Man, you'd be out there doing everything you could in those last 12, 12 hours just in case you could get just an extra bit of reward when you get to heaven. So like Jesus is like, yeah, well done. Well done for that last 12 hours. Um, you know, I just, we'd, we'd pull out all the stops if we knew Jesus was coming. And it seems that even though all the signs around us are telling the, the, you know, the, the, the return of Jesus is soon, and there's still things that need to come to pass before that can happen. But even so, church just doesn't care. And because the church is amillennial in a theology, she looks at Israel and goes, well, that's just, that's, just, that's just annoying. Israel's just annoying. Why does she even have to be there? Not understanding that the book of Revelation from chapter 4 onwards is about a city, a tale of two cities, Babylon and Jerusalem. And everything pivots around that, all Old Testament biblical prophecy. It's all about Israel. Or even the New Testament prophecy, it's about Israel. So if you don't have Israel in your theology, you are completely blind to what's going on in the world right now. It doesn't make any sense to you. It's just illogical. Yeah? So how can we be prepared? Well, I mean, all this is really obvious, really. John 17, 3 says, eternal life is knowing God. Eternal life isn't when you die by and by and you go to glory. Eternal life starts today and it starts by knowing him. One of the questions I like to ask when I go about to other churches, I say, what's the quality of your eternal life? I, how well do you know God? How much time are you actually spending getting to know him and sitting in his presence? And you can hear his voice. Not like a crazy person, but that you know, you can, you can hear him. The next thing is prayer. Prayer. And guess what? Prayer. prayer right? Study the scriptures. Be like the, the, those, the sons of Berea, what they call them, those, those people from Berea, where they just search the scriptures and search the scriptures and search the scriptures. Be a good Berean, that's the word. Search the scriptures. So if you hear like I'm saying something, don't just take my word for it. Go away, go home, read your Bible, and see if what I'm saying is right or wrong, and then that's how it's done. Yeah? You, you, you become good at the scriptures yourself. Watch for the signs of the times, but don't become morose and obsessed with it and just sit and watching like eight hours of doom porn every day because that's just not going to help you. Okay, But be aware of the signs of the times. And I'll give you a little bit in a minute just to cheer you up. And uh, be the body of Christ. Don't be me, myself, I, Jesus, and God channel. That's not church. Church is when we come together as the body of Christ. Okay. Um, I appreciate not everyone can be in a church for various different reasons, but for those that can, I think they should be. Evangelize like you've never done before. Yesterday, now I don't like going out onto the streets and telling people about Jesus because it just, it just reminds me of everything that's just wrong sometimes. It's just like, uh, you know, I've seen too many comedy movies where it's like someone comes up and says, hello, can I tell you about Jesus? You know, it's just like, oh. But anyway, we had to go and do that yesterday. We got trained by one of our interns and she's been, she's, been, she's been trained by some of the best evangelists in the world. She goes on these training courses. And it was actually really good fun. We went out onto the streets 
and it was so easy. We spoke to loads of people, but what really opened my eyes, we were speaking to, I was called, pulled over to speak to a few uh, young girls, because my testimony is from witchcraft to Christ, and the, these young people, they were involved in witchcraft, in the occult, and, you know, and terrible things that have been done to them, and it was just... It was just so nice to be able to speak to them about Jesus and just be there for them and, and pray for them and listen to them. We're not there preaching to them. We're there to talk with them and engage and dialogue and pray for them. And it just, you know, this is just a little snapshot of, of people. I mean, I do a lot of ministry for people, prayer ministry, and it amazes me the trauma, the abuse, the things that people go through. And you just don't know it. You look around and think everyone's living their own normal little life, but you just don't know what's going on in their lives or what, what had gone on in their lives. And Jesus came to set the captives free. And we're the only ones with the solution. We're the only ones with the answer. But we're not doing it. And also, we need to contextualize the gospel to the days in which we're living in. In other words, make it relevant. You don't need to change the message, which some churches are trying to do. The message is timeless. But how you package it can be very timely. Okay? So... So if you're, taught, you're using language that people don't understand anymore, well, you're just going to have to get it a little bit more up to date. But the, the essential elements of the gospel must always remain the same. But people need to hear it. And people need to hear it on a language that they understand. People need to see what's going on in the world and you contextualize it and say, look, there's things going on in the world which the Bible talks about. 1 Thessalonians 5, 6 says, So then let us not be like others who are asleep, but let us be awake and sober. Amen. Right, just to uh, sober you all up, I'm going to um, play uh, this now for you. It's about five minutes long. I had to do a conference the other week on end times, and I showed this. It's actually not that great. I mean, I've seen some brilliant footage, but I didn't have a lot of time to put it all together. So this is just something quick, just to let you know. So <coughs> certain key end time signs, things like blood red rivers, lakes, uh, all sorts of weird stuff, and blood red rain. Um, the Bible talks a lot about the trumpet blasts at the end of days and stuff. Obviously, that has a context for the end of days, but there's some freaky things going on around the world now. It talks about in Hosea, when you see the mass die-offs of birds and animals and fish, it's a sign of God's judgment on the nation. Okay, so just bear that in mind as, as you watch what you're about to watch. Satellite imagery does suggest that this river is surrounded by death. Within miles of its banks, there are little or no signs of life. It's just a death zone. No plants or animals. What is killing all this stuff? Russian authorities are trying to determine the cause of the omnibus change of the Daldikan River, located above the Arctic Circle and flowing through the mining town of Norilis. Why are all the rivers turning red one by one? Don't adjust your screen there. The river you see there really has turned red in northern Indiana. In Revelations, let the waters turn red, and that's the end of time. Yeah. Oh, wow. Reminds me of the Ten Commandments. There. <laughs> A little Hester. bit, right? Yeah, absolutely. Right. Residents in China's southwestern megacity of Chongqing have been puzzled by this strange sight this week. These images of the Yangtze River, the longest in China, have been surfacing since Wednesday. This stretch of the river around Chongqing looks like it's been dyed blood red. People have been recording strange noises like this one in Kiev for some time now. Videos filmed all over the world have appeared on YouTube. I 
don't understand what this sound is. This is the third morning in a row that I've been woken up by this noise. It is three o'clock in the morning and I'm standing outside freezing, but I just don't understand. sound if we've ever heard one one ball no strikes <laughs> and the bunt is foul the count is one and one and what could that possibly be somebody shut the door it sounds supernatural when suddenly this happens. A flock of blackbirds swirl to the yellow-headed blackbirds crashed to the ground and thousands and dozens of them were either dead or severely injured. Thousands of geese were observed dropping from the sky onto a parking lot. Witnesses claimed to have seen them fall from the sky and they suspected that these poor geese were struck by thunder or lightning. Oh no! <laughs> Contractors in Australia have a big job ahead of them, removing millions of rotting fish from a river in the outback. This after an unprecedented die-off. The birds that died were all migratory. They traveled to Mexico from Canada every year. But something like this has never happened before. One netizen seems to believe there were magnetic field issues. What kind exactly? Right now, there was a mystery taking place over the Southwest United States. Birds have been falling out of the sky and dying. We're talking thousands of them in the past few months. Anyway, so that's just like a, a little tiny clip of some of the stuff that's going on. There's some really, really seriously good footage out there of some stuff that's going on right now. But anyway, you might not have seen some of that stuff before, but it, it's going on. It's going on all around the world. And uh, I don't know. I mean, I'm sure some of those things you could explain away. Um, but, you know, when seas that were like three hours before were completely normal, and then within three hours they turned blood red, stay blood red for a few days, and then mysteriously just go back to normal again as though nothing had happened, uh, with, and scientists can't find what's in the water to make it do that. Uh, they come up with a thing they call red algae, but again, they can't really explain what it is and where it comes from and how it appears, and then it just vanishes again. So these are unexplainable events. There was uh, loads of blood red rain in India, and when they tested the rain under the microscope, it had self-replicating DNA in it, and that's impossible. So, you know, these, these, these are signs, signs of the times, and it's there to wake the world up. It's there to wake the world and make the world aware. Time's running out. Look busy. You know, Jesus is coming back soon. You need to sort your lives out. You need to get ready for Christ's return. And the church needs to get herself ready for Christ's return. And it should be a glorious and a joyous thing. He is our bridegroom, and we are the bride awaiting that joyous celebration of the return of Christ. Amen. Lord Jesus, I thank you for today. And Lord, I know that a lot of people on YouTube are watching this, Lord God, and I pray that you bless them, help them, and be with them, Lord God. And Lord Jesus, I just pray, Lord, with all of this stuff, what's this? Oh, sorry. Uh, Lord, I pray that as you give us all this stuff, thanks, Lord Jesus, that we will be awake 
to what's going on in the world, Lord Jesus. And Lord, we just pray in our weakness, Lord, help us and just help us where we're asleep and help us, Lord God, to not be frightened, but Lord God, to lift high our heads, Lord Jesus, we know that our redemption is nigh. And we give you all the praise and all the glory. Amen. Amen.